We are so excited that our next speaker is here for uh, the third year in a row. She is a kinetic, a kinetic arti uh, artist, roboticist, writer, and illustrator from Las Vegas, Nevada. She makes crazy mechanical sculptures that execute nonsensical functions inspired by human qualities. She also documents her projects on her YouTube channel, Gravity Road. She did a prestigious re uh, residency recently at the European Security Academy in Austria and oh, uh, Space Agency in Austria, and I hope that she'll tell us more about it in her talk. So, um, Please welcome to the Hackaday Super Conference stage, Sarah Peckis. Oh gosh, hello? Okay, is this a good volume? Awesome, everyone can hear me, I'm not, all right, not swallowing the mic or anything. Cool. So the imperfect probe and some other things. Um, I, first of all, I just want to I want to thank Hackaday for having me back for the third year. Uh, this talk is uh, more or less kind of a documentation of uh, my progress on this specific robot right here, who I've been working on for the past two and a half, three years now. Um, every time I exhibit him here, I get to talk about my progress and how he's evolved. And I don't know. It's great to be back again to you know show his journey. Uh, but yeah. Hold the stick, probably. Who am I? All right, I'm I'm Sarah Petkus. Uh, like you just mentioned, I'm I'm a kinetic artist and an illustrator from Las Vegas. Um, and this guy right here is a robot named Doodlefeed, and he's he's my child. And he's different than most robots like that you see because um, we're the the function, the point of most things that are created is uh, some element of uh, purpose. Like all all things that we create are typically tools. Um, he is. Uh, Content-based. Oh, rolling back. I mean, stuff that things do. Um, Noodle's different than most robots in that he's based on my my own content. Um, he's from a graphic novel that I illustrate called Gravity Road. Um, I depict him as a four-legged creature that wanders around curiously, interfacing with his environment, and he enacts behaviors and personality quirks that um, I don't know. They're descriptive of him and who he is as a machine. Um, he's not a tool. So his form and his functions are dictated by whatever it is that I prescribe him as being in my own writing. And let's see. So when I set out to create any aspect of him, um, it's I, I, I go back to my writing and I look at what I uh, describe Noodle as doing as a character. So some of the things that he does, let's see, gripping, licking, tasting, um, I'm like skipping through this too fast. Um, <laughs> so his actions are prescribed by his uh, behaviors. Um, and part of his persona is a uh, character is that he's an aspiring space probe. Like he wants to grow up one day to go to another planet and interface with it in a way that's personally expressive or um, like an artist might. So when I go into my head and I try to figure out what it is I want him to do, I imagine what... Um, what a person might do on Mars if they could actually um, enact with the environment in a way that they wish and what a robot might do um, based on what uh, he would want to do if he was in Mars, on Mars. <laughs> oh God, this actually does something. Is it doing it now? Okay. He's just gonna hug the rock, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> What's next? Okay, I'm gonna get, okay. I'm gonna get into this now. All right. So I've been working on this robot for two years. He has this backstory. He's a probe. He he wants to go to Mars one day and and do crazy things to the stuff there. He has a personality, and all of my engineering is based on this personality. So I have to like get it to come out in my hardware somehow. Um, and this is what I've been working on. Um, and in the line of what I do as an artist and an engineer, um, things come through my feed like artist residencies to places. Um, um, there's this big organization in the, uh, what is it, Linz, Austria, called Ars Electronica. I don't know if anyone's heard of it or they're familiar with it. Ars Electronica is awesome because um, they try to encourage overlap between art and uh, science and engineering and philosophy. And they come up with a lot of really cool um, residencies between the uh, different administrations that are in Europe, like CERN and um, ESA and what, whatever else is out there. And in my feed one day, it popped up that there was going to be a residency at the technical facility in the Netherlands called ESTEC, which is a, a part of 
ESA. And that's totally on board with what I'm interested in because as a, I, mean, I don't know, as a Sarah, I've always wanted to grow up to be an astronaut and I kind of veered off into the direction of art. Um, I became an artist. I have a huge long background in creating um, art things and I, for by circumstance, became an engineer and a roboticist just kind of by chance because I do like these things. But my heart has always been in space exploration and you know the pursuit of putting humanity beyond Earth. So um, that's part of Noodle's like personality from me is his mother. I kind of inflict that on him, I guess. But um, when I saw it pop up in my feed, I was like, okay, I'm gonna definitely apply for this residency with this body of work that I've already been developing for the past two and a half years. Um, and I, I proposed doing this thing called the Wandering Artist Project. And again, this goes back to the whole uh, idea that Noodle is this uh, child, like a childlike robot that wants to one day venture far away beyond Earth and do what he wants to do on Mars. Because I mean, when we, I mean, when we think of the the prospect of going out into space and doing things, like especially when we're young, we imagine the cool things we might do if we're there based on our human wants or human desires like we want to go and play games and run around and explore and do you know human things but the reality of it is that you know we we conduct science we get data we bring it back and then you know practicality practicality dictates that that's the sort of relation that we have with all space exploration but this different um, which leads me back to uh, last year so I mentioned that this is my third year here reporting on the state of the state of the noodle um, I was working on appendages for him that were based on his behaviors as a character, but um, I was working on one specific appendage, which I called his tasting foot, and it embodied all the things that I wanted him to do as a robot, um, smashed into one kind of amalgamation, like right there, which um, they were really big, they were clunky, they didn't work well at all. Um, I broke many motors trying to run these things when I exhi like exhibited them the one time that I did. Um, they made white smoke and made the room smell terrible and I had to replace them. Um, but these, they actually gripped onto things, they licked things and they salivated. They, uh, they did strange things, good, good strange. Um, but they were, they're four inches in diameter and um, kind of clunky. Once I got them on him, he didn't look like Noodle anymore. So I kind of broke my own design constraints there. Um, and this is the CAD and then like the, the original concept drawing is, I don't know, crude as that is. So I, I focused on these three behavioral elements. Um, but I decided, yeah, I can do better. Um, I, I brought them here. They were a really good learning process for me. I, I got feedback from everybody at uh, the super conference last year, and I got some really good suggestions on how to make everything better. And I've since done that. Um, and I decided that for this residency, that was going to be the focus of it. What I would what I would put all my energy towards was making better better behavioral appendages for this robot right here. Um, and I referred to these ones particularly as the modes of taste because um, I I don't know I kind of figured. And part of my, my meditation on like what uh, these appendages should embody uh, were elements of adolescence. So I thought to myself, well, um, what does Noodle do as a character and what do children do? And if you think about it, like kids are, they're curious, right? Um, they do want to go to other places. I mean, I guess to a kid, like everywhere you go is another planet because it's new, you're experiencing it for the first time. Um, kids pick things up off the ground that they aren't supposed to. They put stuff in their mouth, they lick things, they drool on stuff. So they, there's a lot of crossover between the two. So he's effectively already very much an adolescent child robot. Um, and I, I decided to, uh, instead of mash everything into one foot, one giant clunky foot, um, I separated them out into four more distinct um, appendages that do very clear cut things, kind of. Um, and the four things I just decided on were uh, the element of giving, sampling, displacement, and affection which are these guys right here. Um, um, and for the residency, like at the beginning of this year, everything kind of got nailed down. And uh, I had between kind of at the end of March and May to get four working proof proofs of concept ready because I wanted to bring them with me on this residency to show to all the people who I met because I wanted points of, points of departure for discussion. So I didn't want to just come there with concepts. I wanted to actually take nonsense and place it in the laps of the people I was going to meet once I got there and get get their reaction to it. So I was like in a, a, quite a rush to get these things done on time so that I had them, but I had two months to do so. And um, 
I'm sure as you as creators, you guys all know like how how rough it is to iterate on mechanical moving and even electronic things and get them to a working state. It can take like a year if you don't work on the project regularly. So um, uh, how was I able to do this? Oh my gosh, Fusion 360, like huge game changer. Um, I don't know. I mentioned this in the in previous years, but I've always used SketchUp because when I first got into modeling CAD, it was the lowest hanging fruit. It was like right there, and, and it's super easy to pick up, and I know a lot of people that still use it. Um, once you get comfortable with something, it's really difficult to switch to a, a new piece of software, but um, if you haven't like switched to a parametric uh, CAD program, I highly, highly suggest it because I, there's no way I would, would have been able to design uh, four working iterations, like proofs of concept in two months, um, without the ability to type in, like change parameters in a field and then have the entire model regenerate. Because um, with SketchUp, yeah, you have to just remake everything. Sorry. What? <laughs> Was I doing it wrong? <laughs> oh, okay. Here's a louder one or a quieter one. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, my suggestion, okay, and I, I'm remembering to say this, so this is good. Um, if you if you were thinking of switching to a better piece of program, like or a parametric CAD program, and haven't um, yet, uh, because of the learning curve, you don't want to like struggle with it for a period of time. Like the what I found that worked for me is to take the the most challenging or most difficult thing that you've ever designed and what you're using right now, and then figure out how to do that in the new piece of software. Um, once you do it, once you replicate it, then you're more or less good to go. And that's what I did. And it took about a week, so it's, it's worth it. Um, another thing is, in order to uh, get these four things modeled before I left, um, I had to do it intelligently. Um, last year when I made those four giant fat feet, um, I kind of just did whatever and then bolted everything together with a frame, like rod. And it more or less worked in the end, but uh, they weren't streamlined, they were fat, they, they were bad. I decided, okay, no, they need to be the same size of Noodle's actual feet, which is a three by nine inch cylindrical footprint. Um, so they need to be thin, they need to be agile, they need to be like power Noodle. Um, and so that's like three by nine inch, I just said that. Um, they need to fit within a frame, so I designed the frame. Um, I needed to keep the top fourth clear for uh, mounting points because these actually switch out onto the legs of this robot right here. I could pull the foam off the noodle and all four of these would pop onto him and he'd be able to very uncomfortably walk around with them. They're just prototypes, but he could technically do so. And um, I made it so that all of the assemblies that fit inside of these feet are independent of the frames. So if I needed to move anything around relative to each other, I could just do so and change wherever the uh, mounting holes were on the frame and then it, it wouldn't be a huge issue. So that was the, the smart way of doing it. Um, and yeah, after two months, I came up with uh, four things that mechanically worked. They didn't have any electronics in them, but I could at least bring these strange objects with me and you know get feedback on them, which I did. Um, I showed up in June. I was there for a month. I stayed in uh, Katwijk, which is on the North Sea of Holland. Really awesome place. Um, ESTEC is like their technical facility. It's it's kind of like uh, JPL is to NASA, but um, they don't. It was a little bit different. They don't actually uh, build their uh, machinery in house. They outsource things, so they do mostly testing and science and whatnot there. And um, I got to more or less roam freely and talk to whoever I wanted and just get feedback openly from people based on what they do. Like I learned a lot. Oh, this is a, I'll talk about this. This is a good encounter. Um, I got a lot of uh, like, let's see, feedback on my concept, like what, what sort of things he should do and why. So uh, one of the things I focused on was the overlap of uh, science, like the science of space exploration and um, humanity. And those sorts of things uh, kind of feed what I end up creating. I also got a lot of actual like technical engineering feedback and I had this play date in their Mars yard where uh, he actually got to play with one of the ExoMars test rovers and this was the the best thing in the entire world for me because I got to just hover like a mother around this huge Martian sandbox. I was rolling in the sand taking video of my kid with ExoMars. Because, I mean, how often does your kid get to play with a, like, I don't know, Martian rover? So, 
this was cool. This was a good day. And he did leave um, up there at the top. He did leave tracks in the dirt and did walk. So I was like, yes, happy. Um, but yeah, um, while I was there, uh, this was important to them because, um, I don't know, I, when we work, we tend to kind of stay within what we're, we're used to, like what we're com comfortable with. And I was the wild card for a month. Like I went there and I kind of, I tried to be as disruptive as possible, like in a positive way. Um, I mean, I didn't burn anything down, but I did, I did go and uh, do things just to, just to kind of uh, incite reactions and responses, responses from people so that I met as many people as possible, but then it also had an effect on them and that, I don't know, there's this unusual person walking around and I don't know, I, I don't know, is there Annie? Has anyone seen Annie? We've never had a little girl, we never had a little girl. No? Okay. <laughs> I used to watch musicals when I was a child, so. Um, but anyhow, this is important for and on both sides because uh, ideas ideas are part of the evolution of technology. Uh, ideas, good ideas, are part of uh, the DNA of anything that exists, phones, cars, whatever. Um, good ideas will stick around uh, because they're good ideas and they'll push things forward while the things that are suggested just kind of bounce off of it and kind of fall to the, the wayside. And um, Noodle now has, uh, he has ESA in his DNA, and Hackaday, for that matter. Um, I've, I, sometimes it's just a, a stupid thing that's mentioned in passing. Somebody will say something like, well, why don't you try this? And you've all had this experience. I'm sure everyone's gotten feedback and ideas just within the past two days. Um, it's gonna sit in your mind, and you're gonna go home in two months from now. You're gonna, it's gonna become something. It's gonna hatch. And right now, like, since this really just finished happening to me, I feel like a baseball. There's just a bunch of stuff wound up, and it's slowly unwinding. And on the inside, there's good things. I just have to wait for it to unwind and, you know, for them to come out. Um, and this is important. I know I'm, I'm sure it has the same effect on the opposite side for them as well. I can't speak for them, but I don't know. I'm hoping I brought things to the table. But then what? Okay, so I got, I got back at the end of June. And it was great. It was like going to uh, Willy Wonka's Chocolate Factory for me. It was space camp. I got to finally go to space camp, for real. Um, and I had two months between uh, June and, I don't know, the end, so September, whatever. That's when Ars Electronica is, to um, redo another iteration of each one of these and hopefully get them functioning. Because at this big art festival in September, which um, uh, Ars Electronica has a big like expose of uh, work every year where they uh, have kind of a philosophical forum. They have a big um, art exhibit throughout the entire city of Linz. Um, it's really cool. It's kind of like Maker Faire, but art and philo philosophy heavy. But um, everything is it's technology. So I didn't mention that it's tech based. Um, it's in September, so I had from June until September to uh, fig figure all my stuff out, decide what I wanted to exhibit. But I had to ultimately report on the uh, residency that they gave me. So I was like, oh man, what am I going to do? I have all of these aspects that I want to uh, show off. Um, and there's many layers to Noodle. Like I bring him every year and everyone asks, like, is he walking yet or is he walking better? And I, I, I sadly have to say kind of, but not really. Um, he wasn't the focus. Like the, the whole aspect of creating behaviors was definitely what it was about for me this year. Uh, so he didn't, he didn't change very much. He was there in spirit to help promote his feet, but it was all about his organs. So I was gonna showcase organs of his, or appendages of his at this festival, but I wanted them to work. So again, another two months and another four spins on uh, this, the mechanisms. And um, this, is what, this is what they do, so I'm gonna introduce them. Um, and of course, talk about them afterwards and show them doing stuff. But um, just so you know what this is, um, the first one uh, is the giving giving module. And this one is, it has the element of gripping, which the uh, foot that I showcased last year had. There are these really long, tendony, retractable toes that um, I gave the appendage that were inspired by, um, there's actually a uh, uh, asteroid miner that JPL has a prototype of that has these long tendony toes that look like hooks. I don't know if anyone's familiar with it. It's called lemur. And um, I was enamored by the fact that this, this robot had toes, hundreds of toes. And ever since I saw it, I, I knew Noodle in some capacity had to have toes on something. And I thought it would be quaint if um, he left objects in his wake. And uh, since Noodle, the character, has an affinity for beans, I decided to design a bean hopper and a foot that would grip onto surfaces and then plant a bean within them. So instead of drilling asteroids, he's just sort of inserting a bean with this appendage. Um, 
the hopper, it's helical. Let's see, I actually have things that describe this. Oh, this is the, I didn't do this right. I was supposed to say all that while this was up there. Um, <laughs> these are instructions for him, so when he grows up, he can actually look and see how to use his feet, because they're not on him yet. Um, <laughs> so the helical hopper, it works kind of like an Archimedes screw. Um, it kind of sandwiches beans in these channels that straddle the flanks of the, the helix, and as it rotates, it carries the beans upwards. Once they get to the top, they pop down through a hole in the center and go out the bottom of the foot, wherever he's like gripping onto. So that's, and, and this is really, really poorly like translated intentionally. So if you have Google Translate, have fun. Um, yes, and that's more or less like the proportions of things, but this is the sketch that I started with, and it more or less, if I go back, um, turned out exactly like that, as rudimentary as that is, it's, it's that shape. Um, but yeah, I had, to, I had to find the right type of bean. Not, not all beans are equal, um, especially when you're making a mechanical like, thing that has to facilitate in like, delivering beans. Like, it wasn't even just pinto beans that worked, um, which is what I decided on. I decided on pintos. I had to find the right size of pintos, so it's not an ideal mechanism. Like, you could never like, commercially sell that as a bean planter because it's, it's ridiculous. But um, that was part of the process. Um, Everything's 3D printed, um, that's important to note. Um, there's no metal on these yet. Um, I actually was able to spin some of the parts of my last tasting foot in aluminum before I came here, um, just to make, make them work. These are old, they all work and they're plastic, so I mean, you can, you can do it. And there's those beans, that's how it works. That's the magic. But they have to be like exactly, I think, six millimeters by five or so. I don't know. It's Touchy. There's supposed to be a thing here. Oh no. Never mind. Moving on. So, sampling. Uh, the next one was the sampling and tasting module. And I mentioned how um, uh, ideas are part of the DNA of a project. Um, this one is important specifically uh, to this conference because I was standing outside in that courtyard where everyone's drinking coffee and eating right now. And I was in a circle with some people talking about tasting feet because. That happens for me. Um, and somebody, somebody asked me, they go, well, does, does the foot actually taste? Which is a weird question at first, because um, I mean, I was like, well, yeah, of course it does. It, it like licks and it drools and it does these like things that are descriptive of tasting. But then I thought about it and I go, well, it's not actually getting any feedback. It's not like sensing anything, which is what tasting is. It's one of our senses. So I was like, wow, I'm, I'm a fake. I'm, <laughs> I was like, this thing doesn't actually taste, and I did it again. You're supposed to be looking at this cool thing. Darn. Um, so I, I started meditating on like, okay, well, how would a machine taste? Like, how would a, uh, a thing actually sample a flavor or some attribute from like a surface or a shape? And immediately somebody mentioned, well, there's litmus paper. You could do like a litmus test. It's like a low-hanging fruit sort of thing. And there's sensors, of course, that can sample for things. And um, the idea of using sensors came up almost immediately, but um, that's not very theatrical. Like, as an artist, like, part of, part of creating these is that they have to be visually appealing for me. They have to look cool. You have to want to watch them function. Um, it's, about, it's about their form, really, and not so much about whether or not they do what they do perfectly well. Um, so I go, well, litmus paper is interesting. It's, it's a more analog form of you know, sampling for an attribute. Um, like like acidity or alkalinity. So I, um, let's see, I decided to, to go with that. It sat in my mind and it stewed for like a matter of months and then at some point I committed to, to actually doing this. Um, uh, the litmus paper actually came in a reel. I got lucky because I, I designed a cassette player, which you see up here, before I even knew that. And I, I was like, yeah, it's gonna have reels and it's gonna carry stuff downwards, kind of like a, like a film projector and then, It'll do its thing, and then I checked. But luckily, yes, you can buy um, you can buy a roll of litmus paper, nine millimeter, just like film or something. I just said, that's Sarah. Um, and I ordered that and loaded it into my reels after modifying them slightly, and it just worked perfectly. So I lucked out. But um, basically, how this this appendage works is it carries the uh, litmus paper downwards towards the bottom of the foot, kind of like a cassette player or a, like a film projector. And um, once a strip is fed to the bottom, it's kind of held parallel to the ground and a solenoid will poke it so that it makes contact with the uh, surface of the ground. Um, has to be wet, but 
I have a foot that does that. Um, <laughs> Once the test is uh, held, it will kind of suck that small strip of ta tape back up into the foot where a uh, color sensor reads the outcome. And it doesn't stop at that. Um, I'll show you on the actual thing. I don't think I got a picture of it. But um, once it, it senses what it tasted, it, it relates that to other things that also you know, had the same outcome. So like, uh, for example, like lemon juice, super acidic, it turns the paper magenta. So if Noodle walks up to something, puts his foot down on it, and he senses that the paper turned magenta, then he will uh, note that that whatever it is he sampled tasted like lemons or anything else that also made the paper turn magenta. Uh, and he'll, he'll remember that. Um, inside of the foot, I, I added a raspberry like Pi Zero module, which is Wi-Fi enabled. So he uh, additionally tweets to his Twitter account that he tasted something too, um, and relates it to other things that he's tasted as well. So I just tasted something and it was chowdery, he'll say that. And I like this because it creates sort of a uh, robotic synesthesia because he's relating tastes to colors. And I think there's something kind of cool about that. Um, yeah, oh here. I, I did this, like I had a weekend where I just went in my kitchen and was like five and was just dipping paper into food. And um, he has a database of just what things could potentially taste like. So everything is a color now in my mind. Like if you state a food, I'm like, oh, that's kind of like an orange, I know this. Um, <laughs> yay, puddle, magenta, chowder, Bloody Mary, toothpaste, yes. So that's kind of how it works. Um, lemons. <laughs> so. Um, this one I think is my favorite. Um, this is the displacement module. Um, one of the things that kids do is they, they will pick things up, carry them around, put them down someplace else where they don't belong and pick up a new object that's more interesting to them. They'll kind of just like take things, look at them, consume them and just dump them. I wanted to create an appendage that allowed him to do that. And um, it's kind of like a throat when you think about it. Uh, it's a reverse throat. Um, I had to solve the problem of uh, putting a foot, a cylinder down on the ground and. Uh, scooping something up into it. And um, one of the parameters that I wanted to satisfy was that once he collects something off the ground, he's able to photograph it so that there's some log that he's actually taken a thing. Um, so up in the top of this foot, I'm doing it again. There, there, visually pleasing. Um, <laughs> there's a camera at the top of this foot that actually photographs what's collected and t also tweets the picture to his Twitter account so you can see what he's swallowed. He'll be like, hey, I swallowed something, look. Um, and there are quite a few ideas that uh, surfaced from my friends when we, were, when we were discussing how to actually have things swallowed up off the ground and they were all terrible, um, like just difficult to implement and just I don't know, an engineering like catastrophe. Like, I, um, are you familiar with those water socks? They're like the infinity tube with the glitter water in them that you can't quite hold on to because they're gonna like fall out of your hand. Um, I was gonna make a conveyor belt out of one of those, but I'm like, there's no way I'll be able to get that working in whatever, two months. So um, the idea that seemed viable at the time was to have two conveyor belts rotate against one another and carry the thing upwards. Um, additionally, so that there's some level of tension put on the thing that's being swallowed upwards, there's uh, the rollers for the conveyor belts are on tracks, like uh, horizontal tracks, and they're tensioned towards one another with rubber bands. So they, whatever's being kind of rotated slowly, like a snake swallows up into the foot, um, it's being tensioned, like sandwiched with these rubber bands. And I, I, this kind of illustrates how it works. But those, the rollers are on tracks. Imagine tracks. Um, oh, here you go, tracks. They look like that. Um, that's them without the belt attached. So those rollers can move freely, more or less, uh, back and forth on the track system. And oh yeah, the belts themselves, uh, I wanted there to be some texture on them so they could actually scoop things up off the ground because something flat wouldn't necessarily do the trick. Um, I actually went hunting, went shape hunting. I don't know if anyone else in this room shape hunts. Like you need that specific thing. Um, but you, you, you have to either go to Home Depot or like, I don't know, the container store and buy something and modify it to get exactly what you want. And in this case it was, I wanted like a silicone textured, um, kind of like, what's it called, cilia? Like the throat lining. And um, immediately, like you can think of a million products that are silicone that have that quality, but none of them are very big. They're like, I think the largest thing I could find was this, it's a scrubber um, that you can like clean 
pots and pans and stuff with. Um, I ordered a bunch of these from Ali AliExpress, and this is actually a, a video that I'm not, there we go. I shaved it. I shaved the pad so that one side was bald and then the other side was just the texture and I cut these into pieces and I sewed them to a conveyor belt so that he has a textured throat and it's inside this thing right here. Um, but that actually facilitates in him being able to scoop things up off the ground at all. So those are his throat fingers. But um, this was a problem I had to solve in and of itself. La la la. Oh yeah, and I started using smaller motors. Um, me, uh, some, of, some other people I know, we like using servos because they're easy and they're great. You can just plug them in and they do stuff. You give them values, simple. I've always used them. This is the first time I actually uh, tried using a DC motor in some things, particularly a, a small thing. So this is the smallest size Pololo motor that you can buy. Um, works great. Um, this is in, I think, every one of these. So I, I tried something new this time. Um, and, oh, this is a video too. So um, this is notable because it's actually driving this 3D printed gearbox. And this is the thing that's running the conveyor belt. So at the top, this guy's doing the spinning and making the throat kind of swallow. Uh-oh, is that 10? Okay. La la la. And yeah, throat camera, I mentioned that. So it's not in focus yet. Like It just sort of takes these really horribly distorted pictures of whatever ends up in the top of his cavity, but it's okay. Like You get the idea. That This was a nut, I think, a big nut. And lastly, the affection module. I think this is this is also my favorite. Um, this one has the other two features from the the foot that I showed last year, the the element of licking and drooling. Um, this one, it, it literally it just it's a salivary system. Um, I think one of the most quaint things that Noodle does as a character is he leaves wet spots in his wake. Uh, so I, I had to have that that had to manifest somewhere. So I, I cut it off from all the other uh, appendages and made it its own thing and focused on how I might do that. And I think last year I, um, I, I was working on a salivary system with a, an aperture because the idea of using a, I did it again, do, using, what's it called, an iris, since they're so visually appealing, they're so delicious to look at. I wanted to have an iris squeeze this gland all around and, and make the juice extrude out. But it, it didn't work. Like if you, if you compress something from all sides, it just kind of like stays put. It doesn't actually crunch it or crush it. At least for uh, what I was using, it, it didn't work very well. So I redesigned this foot to have a claw, like a pinch, pincher. You've seen them, like the mechanical grippers or pinchers, it's nothing fancy. Um, but it actually just pinches this gland. Um, there's a parallel linkage. I can move on. Oh, this is what I did last. Yeah, this is the, the aperture one. It looks nice, but it didn't work. Oh well. Um, so is this is this thing? Here we go. As it move, is it actually actuates and swings downward uh, to make the claw pinch the gland? It transfers that motion downwards to the uh, tongue, and it makes it poke out maybe five or six millimeters, so that he is actually doing the licking motion while he expresses his gland. Um, yeah, and so that, that works, it fulfills both functions. The, the thing that I added, uh, since this is so important to me, is, uh, back on this other slide, a mic. Um, I added a microphone and a speaker to this module so that he amplifies that sound. Because I went through all this trouble of, you know, doing, so you, you need to hear it, like, like really hear that noise. Um, that's kind of Noodle's voice. Like if, if this robot had a voice, it would be like wet suction. Um, let's see, um, <laughs> what suction? So, um, what's, what's running the show? Um, there's a board in each one of these feet right here, uh, that it's called the croissant board because of the shape. Um, it fits around the, uh, mounting point for his leg bones. This was designed by Mark, um, I'm, who's a PC board designer in here, but, um, he helped me out and, uh, spun this really quickly because I had five weeks to to do all of this and there's no way I could have done this myself but um, it it can potentially support the functions for all four of these feet um, you just put it in a mode and it knows which one it is and it can it can do do the job and they look like this they're little croissants and all of these are run by a master brain 
which is in Noodle. This, this board I did design. So this is the one that runs Noodle, and this board will in the future potentially run all four of the croissant brains as well, so it'll work like this. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> but for now, yes. This way they can all operate independently, like for the sake of demoing, um, like now. Um, but in the future, they can be instructed to do do things when Noodle wants them to do those things. So yeah, I ended up showing these at Ars Electronica, uh, as I mentioned, at the end of the summer in September. And I brought the feet show with me. There we go. I displayed these, th they were like his appendages again, his like organs on display in cages. Uh, so people could look all around them, kind of like pick them up and examine them and see what they did um, from all areas around. <laughs> and I took Noodle with me, and he was kind of my, I don't know, my, I hate to say Paris Hilton. No, that's that's a horrible analogy. I don't know. I, it was like my baby. I carried him around Linz. So um, in hindsight, I wish I would have uh, had him taking pictures from his perspective. Um, during the entire time, because I, I was effectively taking my art to see art. I walked around the city with him and he was awake. I had his battery in a bag and I just sort of marauded around with this uh, robot. And you know, it was a conversation piece, but um, he, was, he was there experiencing everything with me and was part of, part of it. And it kind of became a performance art piece at that point. And I, I didn't know this until I got there, but that was, um, I think, I think I'm, this is an assumption, but I think that's part of the reason why uh, this work particularly was interesting to people was that there is a relation, there's a, an analogy to uh, motherhood and childhood uh, in regard to me and Noodle. Noodle's like my baby and I'm like his mother and I represent uh, kind of, let's see, as technology advances, like uh, right now or in the past, we, we most technology, I, I mentioned this, is their tools. Like we create things because we want stuff to serve us better and we want life to be more enjoyable, to be easier. Um, but as things that we make become less tools and more something else, our relation to it will change as well. And I think I embodied some potential relationship that was worth looking into or considering. And I had my kid with me and he has a Nisa beanie. Yeah, it's awesome. But yeah, um, so what's next? In closing, um, the things I'm working on, um, one of them is a taser, taser foot, actually. So, um, like that, the thing that I made is actually meant to be uh, one of his, <laughs> never mind. Um, <laughs> so these are his feet of adolescence. Um, in the future, when I do another meditation on appendages, I want to create puberty feet. So right now, I'm, I'm meditating on what, what does it mean for a robot to go through puberty? Like, what are the analogs between like human puberty and puberty for an AI or a machine? Um, so I wanna do that philosophically, like philosophically, like I wanna meditate on what that would, that would mean, but I also kind of wanna do it in a slapstick sense too. So one of the things that came up was what, taser feet and, and vandal feet and whatever, things that, represent rebellious behavior. So um, that's why I was walking around with a water bottle with a dangerous thing in it earlier today. Um, <laughs> I'm working on recognition. Um, if you peek into his head, he has a little hat on the top of his board that shows his thoughts. I want those to uh, display a status based on whether or not he recognizes things in, in his environment. And I'm working on feet that also allow him to tactilely stimulate his environment. Oh yeah, and walking. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, so in closing, again, I mean, I'm ecstatic to be back here again to, to kind of give the state of my, my child and show this checkpoint again. Like, uh, and thank you for all the feedback I've gotten already from everyone that I've discussed things with. I, I, I don't know, I'm ecstatic to be back here again and that you're all sitting here listening to me talk about feet. So thank you, thank you. <laughs> Follow me. <laughs>